Uh, welcome. We're excited to, to be here and to talk with you today. Uh, my name is Niall Hatch. I am uh, an entrepreneurship professor at uh, Brigham Young University. And uh, I'm, I'm here with my colleague, Brian Reschke. We're doing this collaboratively today. Um, Brian and I both teach a class called Entrepreneurial Innovation at BYU. And uh, one of the things that we talk about there is how to set the right price. And it's actually a really critically important thing because most prices are really bad, badly done, quite frankly, in, in my experience. Um, when I was a teenager, I would watch my father, who is a small business entrepreneur, I watched him set his prices. And I would ask, how do you know? How did, why did you set that price? And he would give me a handful of reasons, and none of them sounded very convincing to me. And, and I thought, well, that's troubling. And I always wanted to know, how do you set the right price? Sadly, bad attitude teenager, I, I really didn't think that my dad was doing it right and, uh, and, and wondered, wondered how to do it better. Um, and, and as I was doing that, um, you know, aspiring, aspiring for more. So eventually, as I continued through school, I went to UC Berkeley and got a PhD in economics. If I'm going to learn how to set price, you'd think I'd go get a PhD in economics and learn how to set price, right? That should be a good place for it. My first semester, first class, it's, it's the weed out class. It's the class to make you go home and cry at night and tell you, you know, maybe you don't belong here. That class was called price theory. And I, and I was going through this price and all the while saying to myself, I don't think that's how people set price. It's clearly not how my father sets price, but I don't think it's how other people set price. How do people really set price? So at that moment in my life, I started a lifelong survey, interview survey, asking people this question. Everybody I ran across who was a manager, and in my career, that's been a lot of people as an academic in management, how do you set your price? Okay, I've been asking this now for decades. And the answer surprised me. It surprised me so much that I've created a startup that sets prices for people because pricing is terrible, and it doesn't have to be. And, uh, it, and there, there are contexts that are fairly straightforward, and I think most of you are in one of those. There are contexts that are almost impossible without, without algorithms and, 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 and a lot of statistics, and, and we tend to solve those problems. But, but we, we, we have this basic fundamental question, how do you set price? I get one primary answer, by far the most common. Could you guess what it is? The most common answer to the question, how do you set your price? Good. How does that help you? It doesn't, right? Um, I once had an entrepreneur come to me and say, I didn't know how to set my price. I went to my VC and said, um, tell me what the price is. You're my expert. You're my mentor. Tell me what, how to set my price. And the mentor said, you know, that thoughtful. Charge them whatever the market will bear. And he said, good. What is that? That's your problem. That, that's your decision. You're the entrepreneur. You know your customers. You go find that out, right? What value was there there? He didn't find any value. He was frustrated. Um, he said, I don't know what to do. Frankly, the VC didn't know what to do. By far, the number one price, they lick their finger and put it in the air. 50% of people will literally go through that motion. They don't know what the answer is. Yeah, they're saying, I just put my finger up and choose something. OK? Is that the right price? It's clearly not the right price. Worse. When people know my background and, and they tell me their, how they set their price, they won't look me in the eye anymore. They're actually ashamed of their pricing. It's not only that it's wrong, but they have an internal pain for not being able to set their own price. People are uncomfortable with pricing because they don't know what to do, and they know theirs is wrong, and they know it matters. How much does it matter? Hmm. Sorry. Let me, let me do one thing first. Um, the, there are three things. When they put their finger in the air, they mean one of three things, in my experience. The most common form of pricing by a long shot is cost plus pricing. I know that my materials plus, plus other expenses generates you know, $10 of cost. And I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I want 100% I want margins because my VC really likes that. And so now my price is 20. Is that the right price? Almost certainly wrong. It's almost certainly the wrong price, but very, very common. The next most common is comparison pricing, which says my rival 
sets their price at 20, and I'm a little better, so my price is 22. What's good about it? Customers do pay attention to my rival's prices when they make a decision about me. What's bad about it? My rival found his price by putting his finger in the air. Right? That's not reassuring at all. What's often considered a highly sophisticated approach is to ask your customers, what is your willingness to pay? You get a big, long list of them. They vary a lot from zero to, to absurdly large numbers sometimes. And then we say, OK, what do I do with a list of numbers? I take the average, right? I paid attention in my statistics class. I take the average. And the average willingness to pay must be my price. It's not. So I'll show you that as well. So here's the dilemma that you run into. You have been out. You've discovered something that looks, looks like it has great potential, looks like customers have significant pain. And you think you can make money by solving that pain. And you can make their lives better to boot. All of that is wonderful and noble and something you should do. And you work so hard at it, and then you set your price. And what is it? Your price sends a message to your customers about who you are and how much value you create and whether or not they're your customer. So if your price is wrong, if it's wrong by being too high, you drive away customers who would profitably buy your product. If it's too low, you're leaving significant money on the table. If it's the right price, and you've solved a significant problem, your customers will smile for the privilege of paying you a premium price to solve their pain. But if you set the wrong price, then they will be confused, and you will be unprofitable, or at least less profitable. So it's a big deal. How big a deal? Let me give you one quick example. From, from some work that, that I've done with my startup in a context where we're, we're setting prices that are highly volatile, and these prices could change um, several times a day, as conditions change, um, uh, it's, a, it's a golf context for golfing tee times. Um, we ran a, a, over, over about 26 months of work by setting prices appropriately. We were generating 40% incremental revenue. Revenue went up 40% um, on some courses that were doing very, very poorly um, by just getting the price right. That's a lot of money on the table, a lot of money that's available for you to capture and we want to show you how. So cost plus pricing is very, very attractive. It's very common because it's easy. Calculating cost is pretty straightforward because they're your costs. Once you know your cost, you say, I want a 40% margin, or I want a 70% margin. Calculating your price is now easy. The big problem with it is your customers don't care about your, price, your cost. They care a lot about your price. They don't care about your cost. Think about something you buy. You care about what price they will charge you. Do you care at all about what cost they incur to generate it? You don't care. It's not your business. It's their problem. I mean, OK, maybe they'll go out of business if their costs are high relative to price, but that just says they're not generating value. You know, Fundamentally, you don't care about cost. So if you build your price, which is a, an important mechanism for talking to your customers, if you build your price on something they don't care about, then it's wrong. It's automatically wrong. A constant margin can look attractive. In a corporate environment, nobody ever got fired for hitting their, their margin targets. Right? Oh, I'm generating 40% margins every month. That sounds really impressive. What if they should have been 70%? They should, that person should be fired for hitting a 40% margin if they should have been 70%. And cost plus pricing will never tell you what it should have been. Comparison pricing is more sophisticated, admittedly. Customers do care about the, the rival's pricing. Customers are paying attention to what your, what your rivals are setting as their price. Um, the problem with it is your rival's price is probably wrong, as we said, and then you're missing an opportunity to take advantage of the out of equilibrium. Um, if they're out of equilibrium and you set the right price, they'll respond. Okay? So if you're responding to them by matching or being close to them and they're wrong, then, then you're staying wrong. And, and, and we could stay perpetually in a wrong pricing situation. And so we want to do better than comparison pricing. But still, it's definitely better than cost plus. The third, sophisticated, um, is, is asking your customers. You, it, it's, it's very consistent with, with a business model canvas kind of world or a lean startup kind of world. If you want to know what your customers, what the price should be, go ask your customers, what will you pay? Okay? That's great logic. It's a great place to start. 
But suppose you've got this big list of prices. What are you going to do with them? The problem is that there's nothing about the average that's right. So you have a big list of data. Think of, think of a demand curve in economics as all of your customers lined up shoulder to shoulder in a line and their willingness to pay being projected out of their head up. Okay? And if they're in order, then you're going to see their willingness to pay descending along some line. Does that make sense? That's a demand curve. That's what a demand curve is in economics. So when you use the average willingness to pay, then you're saying, I'm choosing this as my price. So all the customers who are willing to pay less, they're not my customer. That's not my, that's not my target audience. I refuse to sell to them. Everyone willing to pay more, of course, I'm selling to them. And these people are really happy because we're giving them a relative bargain. Um, but what is it about that customer right there that's not worth selling to? Do you know? Th there's nothing about the average that tells you that anyone below the average is not worth selling to. Okay? The average willingness to pay is the wrong measure to understand. Because what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Sell, yes, but sell for profits. Right? Average willingness to pay will never translate into, profit, into profits directly. There's no, there's no link between them. And we want to go talk about profits. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So here are the steps. And we're going to walk you through these at some length. And, and we'll mail these slides to you as well. So the first thing is the obvious thing, go collect some data. How do you do that? You go walk up to customers and you say, here is my value proposition. I think you have this pain. I think this will solve your pain. What would you be willing to pay for this? OK? Straightforward. We'll talk a little bit more about, at length about how to do it. The other thing you could ask, depending on your product, is how many of these would you buy at a price of $1, $2, and $3? Then you're going to get your data, get it into a spreadsheet, do the sorting and so on that, we, that you need. We'll show you how to do that. Get everything in place correctly. And then you're going to use a very simple method in Excel called Trendline. We're going to show you how to do it. And you're going to estimate a demand curve. Now, does that scare anybody? When I was a PhD student, we were told nobody but a PhD economist should ever estimate a demand curve. It's like the world will explode if you make a mistake or something. I don't know uh, why that seems so scary. But you're going to find the demand curve. We're going to take that demand curve, and we're going to set up a profit formula or a revenue formula. And then we're going to use Solver to do calculus. We're going to use Solver to solve the problem for the optimal price. And then we're going to do what you've been trained to do and what you're coming here to compete to do, and that is we're going to validate. This is a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis based on evidence. And then we're going to come back and say, OK, I got a price. I got a, now a $10.11 price. So I set it at 10 and I ask, how well did people buy? Did it match the quantities I expected? Did it look appropriate? And then I'll, if not, I'll resample, and I'll continue to improve and pivot and, and, and migrate through the pricing space. Please. What is your sample size? Good. Um, we're actually going to talk at length about sampling. Can I, can I delay it just a moment? Yeah, OK. So um, here, is our, here is our sample situation that we're going we're gonna to use as a demonstration. And, and let me tell you the reason for this. About two years ago, I was contacted by the CEO and founder of a company called Gnarly Way. Um, Gnarly Way, as you read in the, in the survey, Gnarly Way makes very clean, pure way for bodybuilders. And, and um, he was also the president of an entrepreneurial organization. And, and they were having an evening uh, get together. And he asked if I would come and give a presentation on pricing. I said, sure. But let's do a demo. I don't want to just talk about it. Let's run a demo. And I said, here's what I would propose. Let me take your product. And let's find the optimal price for your colleagues at this event. So as they walked in, we gave each of them a piece of paper. They filled out a willingness to pay survey. And while they ate dinner, I tabulated the results, generated the price, and then we talked about it. Okay? So we're replicating that here um, with this particular product. What product does it apply to? It applies to every product. right? Um, but, but you've got to have something to pose to all of you. So what we want to do now is, is run from this and take your data while we've been talking, stalling in a sense, teaching, stalling, 
uh, my colleague Brian has been calculating the results from the survey you just took, and we want to take you through the transformation of your data into a price. Good question. Why would you ask this question? Good. We're going to talk about it. The, it, um, it, is, it is a flaw, and we do it because we want to demonstrate the flaw, because sampling matters a lot, and it's one of the, it's one of the important things of, of our message to you today. So we, we're willing to do a bad sample today so that you won't do a bad sample in the future. Okay? Good. But, you know, you're also assuming that your colleagues here are not... That's true. We should do a survey. Of, I mean, look at this crowd. Right. Okay. Very nice. So I'm going to direct your attention to here as I navigate through the survey and a little bit of the nuts and bolts of how we do demand-based pricing with the data you helped us generate today. So I'm, I'm going to switch us over to, yes. We're going to yes. these slides and, and the spreadsheet that we're about to work through. Um, quick, quick survey here, though, for our purposes. How, how many of you have purchased um, um, whey protein powder in the past year? OK, so maybe a quarter. Okay, so good sampling? No, this is not good sampling. Okay, it was a fair assumption, but it was worth asking. Very good. So you may have noticed as you're going into this survey that we started with a comparison point. We wanted to help orient you a little bit to the world of protein powder. So we had a picture of an incumbent product that's already doing very successful, and we're the entrant, we're gnarly way trying to come in and and capture some of what they're doing, essentially. This is probably our, our most notable competitor. And so after presenting that basic background, we then move into a little more specific description of Gnarly Way and show some of how our value proposition is different. We're solving the issue of, of exercise recovery, but we're also doing it by only using grass-fed whey protein. It's free of hormones and GMOs, and it has no artificial sweeteners or colors. So why, why would we want to do that? Why would we want to put up a comparison product before describing the value of our product? Yeah. Exactly. So either this is going to orient existing protein powder consumers to what they're using, and OK, that's right. I'm, I'm using this as a recovery um, product or beverage, and, and now they're offering me something that's edging that out a little bit better. Okay. It's also going to also be a bit of a flash forward for someone who's never encountered protein powder before. So there's alternatives to the way we do that. We'll, we'll talk about that if we have time. But the presentation of the value that you're offering is critical to getting the right price. So the other thing is we also were very specific about the quantity and the duration that we're providing to you, quantity or duration. So if you were to just put in your product or your service and say, what's your willingness to pay? People are left to interpret, well, are you talking about a year subscription to service or a, a year supply of protein powder? They need to know so we have a common reference point for all the respondents. So that's why in the question, we ask, what is your willingness to pay for a one two pound tub? And we also mentioned that this includes 27 servings. So people will get an idea of what they're, what they're biting off. OK? All right, so that was your interface with it. Now we're going to get into the, the man behind the curtain and understand a little bit what this looks like. So let's look first at this tab. In column A of the spreadsheet, I've, I've pasted your raw responses. And I went ahead and, and pulled what you gave us with the session that happened this morning. So we have a little more data. We can um, have a little more reliability in our, our modeling. So what I also did is I then sorted it into descending order, all right? So somebody in this campus is willing to pay $100 for this protein powder. And we won't have you raise your hand if you're here. <laughs> That's fine. We, we then have some coming in at 60 and then a number at 55. All right, already this is valuable information. Even just looking at the raw numbers, we can start to get a sense of the range of willingness. So we're going all the way from 100 down to uh, $10, looks like. Oh, no, sorry, there's zero. This isn't sorted. This is not sorted. I'm sorry. All right, so that's our range. Now let's try to make a little bit more sense of, of that distribution. 
So what I do is then I, I then find what are all the unique values that people put up there. So there's 100, 80, 60, wait a second. I think that's 65, there we go. Okay, so what that then gives us is, oh, I see what's going on. We'll have to, to correct that. It looks like there's like an extra space in one of those. It's not gonna affect things really. What I've got then is um, all the possible answers that people gave. And then in this Q column, D, I'm counting the number of times that response appeared. So again, one person said $100, one person said $80, and this, this is in descending order, okay? So let's go ahead and I'm gonna X this for a second, and let's regenerate the plot. So one great thing about data analysis is visualization. Because it's, oh, we can get some info by, by glancing at these numbers, but let's let a chart come to our rescue here. So I'm going to go to charts. I'm going to do a scatter. You'll notice it's including two series right now. Let me just blow this up a little bit more for you. The first series is plotting our, pri our quantity, that um, number of observations at that price against the price. So that's a starting point for us, but we, we need to know, um, we have to make an assumption here that someone willing to buy this, this product at $60 is also willing to buy it at 55. Basically that people are willing to take a lower price. Now, what would be an example where that would not be the case, where someone might not actually buy a product if it's priced lower? Right. Yeah, yeah. So either the price is some information about the quality is what you're getting at. Other other examples or ideas? So uh, okay. Yeah, and this would affect a, a particular kind of elasticity. It's that even the price itself is part of the good. It's um, often where the consumption is conspicuous. Other people can see that I'm buying this, and it's known to be this expensive. Exactly. This is these status-based goods. Okay. So. That's a separate topic, but nice little aside here. So we need to make that assumption. I think it's safe to do here that someone would be willing to buy uh, the gnarly way for a lower price than the max that they, they said. So we're going to go ahead and delete that series. And now what we've got is um, some data points that can help us outline a demand curve. And it's downward sloping, suggesting that as the price increases, the number of people willing to buy decreases, right? So if you recall from economics, if we wanted to calculate the revenue at a given point, we'd go along this, this price axis, and we say, okay, let's go up to the trend line, and that's the quantity that we'd sell at. And so if we multiply the price by the quantity, that's gonna give us a rectangle, right? It's gonna be our revenue rectangle. And then we're also gonna need to, to take out our cost, which um, we made an assumption that it was $20 a unit for the cost, right? So our marginal unit cost is $20 a unit, okay? So if we were to go with something like cost-based pricing, there's no concept of a demand curve. It's, we, these are our costs. We're gonna go ahead and artificially say, all right, this is our target margin. Um, let's look at how demand-based pricing would stack up against cost plus or comparison pricing or average one. So we've got this, these data points now. Let's, let's walk through the rest of the steps for demand-based pricing before we do that benchmark. So at this point, yeah, clarification before we go on. Well, yeah. Sorry, we could, it's ultimately for Excel, it's gonna give us what we need either way. But yeah, economics has a different convention about which one to do, yeah. Large Q, nice, okay. So. Thanks for helping me there. So it's, it's making a, a cumulative total. So we, we want to know how many people are willing to buy at a price P. So 100, one person. When we get to 80, it's not just the person, the one person who said 80, it's also the person who's willing to do 100. That's why it's two there, and you see how things go. So we make the assumption that 55 people would be willing to buy at $1. Exactly, exactly. And that's the total number of response pooling your sections to you, okay? All right, so now we're gonna to try to, to model this a little bit.
beyond the rough view that these data provide us. Now let's try to model this so we can get a little more fine grained. So I select the data series, and it's going to vary based on what, what tool you're using. But in my 2011 Mac version of Excel, it's add trend line. And we've got options here. We could do a linear trend line, just a, a straight uh, best line of fit. Another option would be exponential. Let's go ahead and do exponential just to give us an example of a slightly more sophisticated model. And I'm also going to choose the option to display the equation and the R squared on the chart. And um, you can read up on precisely what R squared is communicating. But basically, we can look at the R squared to help us compare the models. This one is telling us that um, of the R squared is 0.93. And as we're approaching one, that's better. So. If I was to do the linear one, it's actually like 0.89. So the exponential is providing a better fit. So we'd be more inclined to go with an exponential model for these data. I'm just going to increase this equation a little bit. OK. So now we've got an a, uh, a demand curve estimation. And again, I can say, for a given price, what's the quantity that I can realize? So now I can look at data points that aren't covered by my responses and say, all right, about $70 was the quantity that I could demand. And I can come across and see it would be about five units. So five out of 55 people pulled across your rooms would be willing to buy a one tub, think of gnarly way, at a price of 70 Okay. So that's the advantage of the demand curve is we can extrapolate the data points not immediately reflected in our results. Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to find the rectangle that's going to maximize our profit. And so first thing is I'm going to, looks like it's, yeah, this is right. So I'm going to create an equation here. I'm just going to do the zero for a second. And this cell H4 is going to reflect this equation, 94.739 times multiply the, the product of the exponential of negative 0 0.042 times some price I force. For now, price is set at zero. So there's, there's not a price uh, provided. And we can start to manipulate that price ourselves. So what if we charge $40? Then that's going to produce us a quantity of 17.65. Okay. What if I did $100? It's going to estimate we sold one and a half units. See, that's what we're doing. We're varying price. And then I also have some other equations here to help us calculate revenue, which is going to just be the product of our quantity and the price itself. So if I charge $100 and get 1.42 units and revenue of $142. Okay? Then last step here, um, cost. Right now, our assumption is that it's $20 per unit for our, for our gnarly way company. So the profit is just going to be the total revenue minus the total cost. The cost here is going to be this variable cost by, times by the quantity. Right? So at $100, we could expect profit of $113.65. You with me so far? Now, I've been varying this price, and I could brute force try to just do it by hand and take a look. Or I can use a tool, Solver, which is available within Excel. What I'm going to do in Solver is I'm saying my objective, the thing that I'm wanting to get the most of in this case, is profit, cell L4. And I'm going to get that profit by changing one cell, which is my price. I just want Excel to vary the price a bunch until it comes up with the, the profit maximizing price. So I'm going to go ahead and click Solve. And it's going to change things up for me. And this is giving me an optimal price of $43.81. Okay. Let's take a look at how that benchmarks against our others. So I'm going to navigate back to our slides. We're good? OK. So here's our our cost plus approach. This is 
not the demand curve that I showed you in a second. This is based on this morning's data. Okay, I could quite get to manipulate the slides in time, but um, it's very very similar result. The cost plus says, okay, we're we're assuming um, again our our variable cost per unit is twenty dollars, and suppose we had a, a margin target of fifty percent. Okay, we're doing a fifty percent markup on our costs, so our price would then be thirty dollars. 50% of 20 is 10 plus 20 is 30. So we look at our, our demand curve that we estimated and say at 30, how many units would we sell? We come across, it's about 13 units. So that's our revenue rectangle, but then we need to less our total cost. So at that quantity, 13.08, we'd have a and a cost of 20, we'd have a cost rectangle reflected here in this area. So the difference between our total rectangle, our revenue rectangle, and our cost rectangle is gonna be our profit, this one. So this slide's got the, the cost rectangle. In the future, I'm just gonna include the, the profit rectangle, right? So $130.89, that's the price to beat. That's beating, we gotta beat finger in the air. Let's see if we can do it. Comparison pricing, right, here's where I, it's again a, a similar thing as cost plus, but it's now taking a competitor and saying we're a little bit better than them. Let's mark things up again 50% and, and see what, how, what that achieves. So assume that our competitor's price is $25. So 50% markup would give us $12.50 plus our, their 25, so $37.50 or comparison pricing. Let's look at it again. So we go 37.50. That gives us um, quantity of 10 units, just about. The profit for that is 176.18. So we're we're getting a bit better, um, but let's see if there's any further uh, revenue profit that we're leaving on the table. Let's go now to average willingness to pay. So this is potentially a, a step up from cost plus or comparison based pricing, in that we're talking to customers. Like Niall said, this is more in the spirit of, of our business model canvas that we're engaged with our customers, we're trying to understand for them. So one thing I could just do is take all the responses and average them. And that produces a price from this morning's data of $35.38. We put that into our equations and we get an output of 166.78, which as we can see is doing better than cost plus, but is um, actually edged out by comparison price. So that's, that's going to be problem specific. This isn't necessarily always going to be the case. It's going to be different for your business than it may be for this business. All right, now lastly, the, the grand champion, let's look at our demand-based pricing. Again, this is trying to optimize the price based on this, trying to use all the information that we've collected. And here, with a optimal price of 48.57, we achieve a profit of 195.23. So to sum it up in a spreadsheet format, demand base is coming out on top, and in this case, um, from including your data, Average willingness to pay actually comes next, followed by comparison pricing and lastly, cost plus. Now, is this a big deal? Suppose, um, let's give me a number for annual or for monthly sales. So how many units gnarly will you make in a month? Uh, Thousand units, great. So suppose we want a cost plus pricing. Let's take a minute and compute what's the difference between a cost plus and a demand Based. Like, what is your expected difference in revenue, or, or that is expected difference in profit? Out of those approaches. Okay. All right. And that's monthly revenue. So, we can see getting this right has major implications for how much value we we can capture. We're creating a lot potentially with with Gnarly Way by going beyond synthetic inputs to our product. We're now getting it to something that's a little more environmentally conscious. It's potentially healthier for the, the users. And we could uh, go following the leader of, of our incumbents, 
or we can get a little more input using Define. Now, yes, before we move on, though, I, I want to say big caveat on all of this is whether we've got the sample right, right? And so how representative do you feel, personally, you are of gnarly waste target market? Entrepreneurs are, of course, notorious for how much extra time they have on their hands to work out and to be taking care of themselves. I'm not saying you can't do that. I think work-life balance is desirable always. Um, but who would you want to, to have in your sample here? Right? Okay. I can. I. Um, and how would I find them? It's subject for another lecture, but. Here's where we want to look for the magnets, the things that are pulling those people together. So if I go wait outside of gyms, or I go to GNC and I'm, I'm talking to customers in line there, I'm then able to get closer to my target market. Now, I don't want to just capture them, though. I'm often interested in broadening markets. So that is where a sample like this would be beneficial, but it's, it's crucial to understand what are the data that I have and what are the data that I aspire to have and understand that. Question, yeah. Okay, so around this whole learning decay. Yes. So the question is how do you frame that in the right way? And so you just okay. thought about what we should be able to pay. Other people might be able to beat that to pay the price we should be willing to pay. There's right. also another method that says at what price quantity is too high that you would buy, what price is too low, precise to consider it to what's the right price. So how do you view frame the willingness to pay in the right way? Like, yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, there's another method, as you described in there, we present a schedule of prices. And this is especially applicable for non-durable goods where I use it and it's gone. So for instance, if I was trying to price movie tickets, once I use the ticket, there's not a benefit of it. I, I can't, unless I'm enjoying the memory of that movie again and again and again, that's a non-durable good. And so that one has a little trickier, it's, it's something that requires longer time than our 15 minutes, um, but we can throw you some content that would point you in the direction for that. So that is important. Like, um, suppose we could just do a very simple A-B test of where I, I reflect just the minimal details of my product. Okay, we're organic, no GMOs, we're potentially environmentally friendly, okay? And that's it, just minimal, minimal. Oh, the alternative would be, hey, we're going to give you a three-month supply of Gnarly Whey, and we'd like you to try it out. And then at the end, you price it then. So after they've had the immersive experience of being in the product. So what are the, what are the advantages of the immersive pricing strategy? Having them simulate a prototype or the experience with it. What are, what are the advantages of having that pricing information? Is there no advantage? Yeah. Yeah. So it may help us cap know what's the value of a returning customer. It's someone who's now they've interfaced our products, they've even had a chance to, to benchmark it or try and test it out with others directly, and, and this is what their willingness to pay is. But that's very, very high customer acquisition costs if we're having to give everyone a three-month supply before they're going to understand the value. So if we go with the more extreme example of the minimum value proposition, basically, then that's going to give us what, what kind of penetration could we get with, with just a bare bones, banner ad type demonstration of our product. Okay, so is there a right answer, which one to do? No. It's actually best if we can get a mix of it to understand more qualitatively from focus groups or interviews, um, on the ground, prototyping, as well as the more broadcast kind of survey collection we've done today. Yeah? Is there a danger from um, when you ask people what they're willing to pay, I would naturally go to the lowest rate I'm willing to pay, as opposed to what the product actually works. Got it. So you're asking, how, how believable are these data? Are people are aware that I'm asking this price for a reason, and if I care about the product, I might actually be incentivized to, to lowball it as much as I can so that I can enjoy that. So there's, there's different things we can do. One is we can use some sensitivity analyses, and that's where we can vary the, the kind of information that we provide about the product. 
and, and see how that information affects their responses. So if the fact, the, the mere introduction of the other um, attribute changes the pricing, then that should, that should give us some information. Um, the other is we can also inform our, our customers. You know what, we're trying to understand um, what's, what's the real price for this in order to know whether this product should be in the market. And so if they, you can do that with some customers to help diffuse uh, some bias. Other comment, Bob? Yeah. So, in the golf course example that you made, uh, was that $3,800 a day increase, um, or a week, or a month? I didn't see a time on that. Yeah, that, that's because that's because I, I have to be cautious about oh, the proprietary okay. nature of the data. All right. So my question is: is is this something? Did you ask these types of questions um, to develop that, or did you go by just trial and error. We're going to raise it to this price during this yeah. time. So in that case, there are no experiments. In that case, though, I have some historical data to use. So, so one of the challenges about this kind of work on an existing product, and this relates to, to the question earlier, um, if, if we were to ask, what are you willing to pay for a Snickers bar? Right. Nobody's going to tell us anything above the current price. Right? There's no incentive to. Um, Setting, resetting a price that exists is really, really hard. This is one of the few cases where being an entrepreneur has an advantage because, because when you say to someone, I think you want this, do you agree? Then what are you willing to pay for it? You have implied that if you don't tell me the truth, you may never get this solution, right? And so you're much more likely to get an honest answer. Will they lowball me? Yes. We also know that people have a tendency to overestimate their willingness to pay in a survey compared to what they're really willing to pay. Does it balance out equally? I don't know. But it's way better than cost plus. Okay? So, what, what, what do we do in our context? Um, in, in, in the golf context in particular, um, we have some historical data that we can use because there's a fair amount of price volatility that we use. We also do some survey work. Um, you have to be really cautious about how you do it, obviously. But if you say, I think you have this pain, I think this is a solution, um, what would you be willing to pay for a solution? I find most people are willing to answer. I think many of those people are willing to give an honest answer, roughly, as best they can. Um, should that question be, what are you willing to pay? Or should that question be, what would you expect to pay? Or when would it become too expensive? Those are all pretty equal questions. The challenge with A-B testing is now all you have is two data points. Right? You know that this one is better than this one, but you don't know what the right one is. So, so is this perfect? No. But it's way better than pretty much everything else. <laughs> and over time, because I don't believe this is the price, I believe this is a hypothesis. And I would go start, I would take this and start testing. Exactly. And, and so the price represented here is going to, assuming that we've got a representative sample, it allows us to extrapolate to, to blow this up to what our Ultimate, um, it's, it's a better number than our total um, available markets. Okay, it's it's getting us a, a closer estimate of. So, for instance, we have here under demand base that we would um, have 15 units sold to 55 people, which is a penetration of about 27.4 percent. So, if we know um, that what we just um, sampled is a 0.01 percent random sample of our target population, then we can extrapolate that up to what our expected profits would be at saturation. Okay, so ultimately, why it's crucial to get the price right, yes, we can make more profits. Also, if we have a, a personal stake in the problem of customers that we're solving, we're going to be able to be a more sustainable provider of a solution to them by extracting more value and be able to reinvest that into our company and to uh, also discover and solve other pains close to their problem space. So we're, we're getting close down to the end of our session, so we do want to open up for, for Q&A, and we have up until the hour, correct? Or, yeah, um, we started late. Technically not, but we started late. Right. So, sure. So, yes. Okay, so knowing that this is not a perfect example, would you still use this, the data to collect the price? All right, so what kind of sample do we have? Let's take that discussion. 
So we've got, we've got a convenience sample. Um, you guys are, are here. You came to me. You're a captive audience. You came to us. <laughs> kind of captive. And certainly not random. Not, not, not random. random. And worse, not our customers. Right? So would I use this price? My advice to, to the young man who started Narly, the company Narly Way would be, that's not the right price. But if he were to go sample at GNC and, and other health food stores and gyms, I think he should start with that. And I think he should take, uh, do, do some focus group work. I think he should, he should put it out there in the internet where you can make prices, prices fluctuate without much damage to your brand and test it and ask, are customers behaving like this model suggests they would? If, it, if they're not even close, then I would pull back and I would do some more sampling and I would do some better sampling. <laughs> if I'm close, I'm much more confident that, that, I'm, that I'm in the right neighborhood. I don't think you ever do the perfect sample. For example, we ran a sample this morning and we generated an optimal price of $48. We added your data and the optimal price fell to $44. Do we have it right? No. But our sampling's not very good. So what would I be willing to do with this? I'd be willing to run tests with it. I'd be willing to put this in front of customers. Would you buy this at $44? And, 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 and test that with a number of people. Yeah, exactly. I, I think this is, uh, yes, yes, yes. Because ultimately, what this is telling us is there is a subset of a market that's willing to endure a price higher than cost plus. I mean, that's already information that's valuable for us. If you're not seeking this good and you're willing to tolerate a price this high, then it suggests we may be able to um, find a higher price among our target market. I mean, this, this is leading us to do more testing. That's what this initial jab is getting us. All right, so I'm going to be in the business. And good. I can't just hand out a bunch of you cannot. You, it, okay, uh, this, is, this is a contextual problem. B2B is harder. Most B2B contexts, your clients will not answer questions like this and shouldn't, and you need a different method. And um, I am, based on the feedback from the earlier session, I'm gonna organize a Skype workshop on how to do B2B pricing uh, soon. Okay, so, so leave, leave your contact information and, I, and, and we'll let you join that. B2B is just a different animal. You can't do this. Unless, unless your B2B is really small businesses where there are lots and lots of them and they'll tend to answer surveys. But if you're talking about enterprise work, um, typically you can't do a survey. Yes. How, do you, how can you factor things like that? So, so there are a wide variety of things that we didn't include here, not because we shouldn't, but because we didn't ask any more data than that, right? But I'd love to know things about demographics. I'd love to know things about geography. I'd love to know other things. I'd love to know uh, about some of the other considerations that generate profitability. This profit function is as simple as price, quantity, and marginal cost, and that's it. You're saying profit function is more complicated than that. Great then I'll build a profit function that represents reality, and I'll find the price from that. So really simplified case, and, and you know, the burden is on you to, 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 to build the model, a simple model, but a model that's representative of your situation. This is a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so you're right. To, you're right to talk about that. Should I have a high, a high end product and a low end product and price both segments and and price both of those optimally? And the answer is yes. But only if you can see. By the way, I think we can see it personally. I think we can see two customer segments yeah. in these data. I think each of those bulges is a different customer segment. And, and frankly, 
the low priced ones are non customers, right? I mean, we did that by raise of hand. But if you have evidence that you have multiple sets of customers, you should bring to them multiple tiers of products and price those appropriately, but not at first, right? As an entrepreneur, your, tar your focus is get one customer segment right and grow from there. Okay? Exactly. And so set the right price for your customers. And if you have more customer segments, deliver them a solution for their issues and price that one correctly too. Can we do a wrap up? Just really quickly, a couple of thoughts. I want to submit to you with evidence that there is an epidemic of terrible pricing in the world. So I told you I've been doing a very, very long survey of people about their pricing. In all, my, in all the years I've asked, two people have ever told me, we love our pricing. Let me tell you what we do. It's really cool. And it was OK. My sample includes Apple. They're not one of the two. Apple doesn't set their price right, and they know they don't set their price right. Uh, I've never sampled Microsoft, but they don't have their price right, and they probably know it. Um, pricing doesn't have to be hard, but almost everybody's uncomfortable with it. Almost everybody is getting it pretty substantially wrong. 10, 20 percent errors on price represent big errors on profitability, and they're unnecessary. So, so our message here is um, it's not that hard to fix. Many of you are already collecting willingness to pay data as you're trying to measure the depth of the pain of your customers. Good, you already have the groundwork. Take that with all the errors, with all the warts that, that, that those data have, turn those into prices, consider that a hypothesis, and, and, go, and, earn, you know, go and earn even more profitability by getting your price right. Um, I, I love entrepreneurship. I love innovation. You are building things that make people's lives better. Let those people pay you for making their lives better. To do that, you're going to have to do your pricing well. And, and we're excited for the work you do and uh, really encourage you to go out there and, and, and make the world a better place. Thank you.